Well, let's have a quick word of prayer as we begin today. Father God, this is not about me. It is all about you. And today you've hand-selected, hand-picked each person that is here. And I believe that you have something for them. And I just pray that you might take away anything from me that keeps me from sharing exactly what you have in mind. And I pray that the power and the presence and the potency of God might be made aware in this community. Bless us now with your words. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. David, in his psalm, I love his psalm, he makes an invitation. He says, taste and see that the Lord is good. It's, a, it's, a, it's an invitation to taste and try and understand how good God is. And this week, we've been talking about the goodness, the greatness, the awesomeness of God. In fact, our entire purpose this entire weekend has been to try to pull God away from the people who think that they've got the correct definition of God. And I've kind of used God to beat people with. You know, the people who tell you, you are not adequate, you are not sufficient, you are not good enough for this great, awesome God on the other side. This weekend has been reimagining the God most of us have grown up to believe in. A God that sits somewhere high up and waiting down low to see whether or not you make a mistake and can't wait to write it down on a piece of paper that he's going to show the whole world when he comes back. That God is the God I want to eradicate from your mind. And I pray that the Holy Spirit is able to reveal to you the true God, the God who the Bible defines as a God of incredible, unimaginable, undescribable love. That is the God we pray to understand. And love, for every single one of you, love has many facets. What we've discovered and last night we talked about is that God is first and foremost love, and then everything else about him must be judged through that. So God's justice, God's wrath, God's eternality, everything about God must be filtered through his love. That is the most important thing you have to understand about God. When we talk about the idea of reimagining, we must first understand what does it mean to reimagine. I hope that this is on your screen. Is it on your screens? Reimagine, is that on there? They're going to get it up there. But in the meantime, what it means to reimagine, at first, we, we talked about imagine is not dealing with believing in the unreal, but imagine is to make a mental image of, a, a mental picture of, to define something through concepts and ideas in your mind. So to reimagine is to reinvent, reinterpret, to imagine again, to form a new conception of. So if we are going to reimagine God, that means we must form a new conception of who God is in our mind. And that Jesus, Jesus calls us to reimagine God. As you talk about our theme, grace, we're trying to understand grace as the means by which God reveals to the world who he is. And he did that first in the first testament through the law. He showed up in the law and he says, the first thing he says, because I've taken you out of Egypt, therefore you shall have no other gods before me. But notice it says, because I've taken you out. That means since I've rescued you, now you can know my character. The law does not come before the rescue. The rescue comes before the law. And therefore, God says, God says, look, look, because I've rescued you now, you don't need to have any other God. You don't need to bow down, serve, put anyone else in front of me. I will be for you. He says the same thing to Abraham. He says, I will be your great reward. You don't need to have any other God you don't need to bow down to anything that was made in heaven, anything that was made on earth, anything that looks like anything else, because I am your true God. I'm on your side. 
in the law, we see God saying, you, 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 listen, this idea of work hard, work hard, work hard, work hard, work hard, work hard to achieve more, achieve more, achieve more so that you can be more unhappy about the stuff that you buy. This idea, you don't need it because you can rest. Again, he says in another place, God gives his children sleep. He says, in vain you rise up early, and in vain you go to bed late at night, because God gives his children rest. So he creates an entire day, which was Adam's first day. An entire day in which you can rest. God creates the entire world, finishes it up, calls Adam to help him finish creation. We talked about that yesterday. To finish creation, Adam starts naming all these awesome things. God says, I think that's cool. I think that's good. Adam names and names and names, comes up with all these ideas. And then he gets, he gets to, the, to the finish line. And then right in the eve of the night, God says, well, it's not good for Adam to be alone. So he sends Adam into a sleep and he wakes him up and he brings her this awesome, beautiful Australian woman. Psych. He sent her Tiffany. <laughs> and Adam sees this woman and he goes, whoa, whoa came out he, he had no longer any ideas he had giraffe lion oh mosquito oh grasshopper and, and then he sees this whoa ho, 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 ho. <laughs> whoa Ooh. you shall be called whoa ho, ho. whoa man <laughs> whoa man because you came out of man <laughs> You're the woe to my man. <laughs> bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, Adam becomes poetic. And then Adam and Eve come in, and out of nowhere, God comes and solidifies that marriage and says, it is very good. Notice that the only thing that gets very good is relationship. You guys aren't ready. You're too hungry. The only thing, everything else, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good, and it was a good, and it was good. Adam and Eve comes. He has this whole poetic thing. They get, they get together. They get solidified, and then God goes, wow, that's very good. That's very good. Why? Because it's the only thing so far in all creation that has a semblance of who he is. Because he himself is a community of eternal love. And when he looks at Adam and Eve, he goes, that's me. Male and female created he them, and in the image of God, he created them. And then God says, okay, folks, time to rest. Well, well, well we, we just got started. The first day of the week, we got so much work. No, nope, you don't have any work because I've already finished it all. No work needs to be done. Nothing needs to be added. No, no, the stars is in the right place. The sun is where it needs to be. Everything is finished. It is finished. And Adam and Eve had to believe that God had already finished the work. And so in their belief, they rested. That's why right there in the transcript of God's character, he places right in the middle on the seventh day, you shall rest because in six days, God created the heavens and the earth and everything in them. Therefore, remember that I don't need you to keep you. I don't need you to create you and I don't need you to sustain you. I don't need you to maintain you. I only want you. So come and rest. And, and, and everything after rest is about relationship. Honor your mother and father. Don't lie to your neighbor. Don't kill. Don't steal. Don't covet what your neighbor wants or has. You realize that the entire thing afterwards is relationship because it is in community that we rest. And it is in community that we are restored. And it is in relationship that we are rescued from restlessness. 
character of God, the law. And this week, we realized that out of grace, from grace to grace, when the law came and showed us who God is, we took that law and created something magnificent called religion. A system of beliefs that declares that you are part of a community. I believe in this, you believe in that. In every church website, you have what they call beliefs. Because we identify with the community based on what they believe in. And we declare that that community is good or bad if I agree with their belief system. And so we took these principles that were meant to help us engage and guide into a Jesus community. Because it was all about Jesus even from the first test of it. We take that and we create a way by which we can divide each other and balance one another by saying, I am better than you. And so God said, you took my law, you messed it up. And it was grace, it was meant to rescue you. Not only did that, it's part of the human thing to compare with one another, the, the other thing was that there was an inherent defect in humanity in which we wanted to be our own gods. And so that in itself messed us up because Paul later says in Romans that the minute the law came, we wanted to rebel against it. There's a little girl called Yazzie in my church in Chicago. And, and, and um, Yazzie was a very interesting um, young girl. In fact, she, I would call the epitome of humanity. She acted the way humans act. If, if, if Yazzie came by you and your, her parents said, you know, say hello to the pastor, she would look at you uh, and then go, nope, walk away. Uh, in fact, in fact, she would look at you so that you can know she's not saying hello to you. No, it's not happening for you today. And her parents would go, come on, Yazzie, please say hello. You know, parents, you don't want to get embarrassed, right? So come on, we practice this at home. Please listen to me. And Yazzie would just, you know, but then her parents realized something, that if you wanted Yazzie to do something, all you would have to do is tell her to do the opposite. So then they would go, Yazzie, don't say hello to the pastor. Hello. Hello, Yazzie, no, don't, don't, don't give the pastor a handshake. Hey, pastor, hey, pastor. Anything that you wanted her to do, she did the opposite, and that was humanity. Don't lie, we lie. Don't steal, we steal. Don't kill, we kill. No matter what, the law that was meant to rescue us actually created the standard by which we went opposed to God. And so the grace of God sent us Jesus the fullness of who he is. No longer a written transcript of who God is, but the embodiment of God in human flesh came to show us who God really is. And when he came down, he said, you have heard that it was said, but I tell you, in your law you've seen this, but this is who my father is. He says at the end of, at the end of his journey with the disciples, he says, look, you can ask for the father anything, anything. In John chapter 16, you can ask the Father anything. Why? Because the Father loves you. He says, listen to what I'm, I'm saying to you. Jesus said, I'm not telling you that I will ask the Father for you. I am telling you the Father will give it to you because he loves you as much as I love you. What was Jesus saying here? I am not some mediator between an angry God and a begging sinner. I and the Father love the begging sinner. I am the skin on godliness so that you can see how much I love you. But I do not stand in between of you and God. And that is what I want you to capture. That Jesus is God in flesh showing you how much he loves you. Paul, in the book of Ephesians, helps us to understand that. Ephesians 1, verse 3, Paul starts to talk about who God is and who we are, which is the reason why we're here today. 
at the end of the day, all I want you to understand, we've reimagined God. We've seen Jesus talking to us as God. We've seen him face to face with the sinner last night and what he does. And today I want you to grasp not only the character of who God is, but how does God view you and I? That's the question. How does God see you? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Have you ever looked in the Bible and you see words like David was a man after God's own heart? Well, what about me? How does God see me? What does God think of me? And that's the question. In Ephesians, we're going to see that. We're going to understand what that means. In Ephesians 1 verse 3, I hope it's on your screen. It says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. One of the things you're going to learn throughout this, throughout this is that Ephesians tells us that we are first seen through the lens of Christ. Just as, watch, just as we see God through the lens of Jesus, God sees us through the lens of Jesus. Okay, okay, let me, let me try to put it in another way. The same way Jesus is the lens through which we see the depth of God's love for us, and Jesus is also the lens through which God sees the depth of our worth to him. The greatness of who God is is exploded through the life of Jesus and the greatness of humanity is demonstrated through the life of Christ. Well, well, what do you mean? When Christ lived, he kept saying over and over again, I am the son of what? Man, what was he declaring through heaven? He was showing all of heaven, this is what humanity can look like if it has a chance. Oh my gosh, you're not there. You don't get it. You don't, okay. Jesus put on humanity. He put on human so he can show not only the Father, because the Father knows, so he can show all the angels who are doubting God. Why will you waste your time on this? Jesus came. This is what this can look like if it is obedient to the Father. This, this is what humanity can look like. So the angels are looking, and the angels see man breaking bread and feeding 5,000, showing that man can solve the human problems if it is obedient to God. Jesus shows the entire universe that once under the leadership and the guidance of God, man can not only rescue himself, man can rescue each other. So man walks and taps people, and people who are sick are healed. The Son of Man walks on water, and the water obeys. The Son of Man walks into a storm and says, peace, be still, and the storm bows down. Why? Because Jesus was showing what humanity 2.0 looks like. See, Romans says that the entire creation is groaning and yearning to see who the sons of God are. You know what that means? Earth is looking, where is my master? Because in Genesis, God had given authority to dominate the world to Adam. And by having dominion, he did not mean to use and abuse, but to care and to nurture. Do you know that in the book of Revelation, it says that God will destroy those who destroy the earth? Because you and I are called to protect, take care of, and nurture the creation. And the creation is being abused, and they're crying, where are the sons of God? And the son of God came. Peace be still. And they said, yes, master. And he said, let me walk on you. And the water said, yes, Lord. The Bible says that the lions and the creatures came and fed him in the wilderness. They finally had their master back. Not the son of God, but the son of man. You see, through Christ, in Christ, we are what we are fully created to be. 
And when you look at Jesus, you do not only see God, the Father, but when you look at Jesus, you see yourself in the future. You'll get that later during lunch. Verse 4, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world. He did what? He chose us in him before the creation of the world. Uh, to be what? Holy and blameless in his sight. That is the way God sees you is that God sees you as holy, set apart, different, unique in his sight. You are created to look good. Come on, somebody. In his sight, you were not only created to look good, you were chosen as good. You were chosen in him, Christ, before the foundation of the world. Do you know what the foundation of the world is? The Bible talks over and over again, the foundation of the world. Why? Because when Genesis opens up, you already see the foundation of the world. By the time Genesis opens up, in the beginning, the, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without four men, void. That's the, that's the foundation. You see, but Ephesians is talking about a time before Genesis when there wasn't even an earth that was without four men, void. Before there was even an iota of creation, God chose you. I don't think they did, but thank you for helping. <laughs> God chose you. That means, listen, you know what it means to be chosen? It means to be selected amongst many. He chose you. Chose you before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Verse, the next verse says, in love. He did not just choose you. He chose you out of his love for you. Now, this is what I, I this is gonna be hard for you, but I'll, I'll try to try to put it in a slow term so you can grasp it. Um, he chose you and loved you. Do you know what when I was when I was 12 or 13, I don't remember, but um, don't judge me. Uh, when I was 12 and 13, I used to any any girl that was beautiful, I would go, "You're so beautiful. I love you." And they would look at me and they go, but you don't know me. And I go, I don't need to know you. You're beautiful. I love you. And my mom would go, you don't just say those words. You have to know who you love. Now, if the Bible says that God loved us before the creation of the world, that means he must have known you before the creation of the world. Because he doesn't choose blindly. That means before the creation of the world, you were in existence for God before you existed. Jeremiah 29 verse 11. Before you were, actually Jeremiah 1. Before you were in your mother's womb, I knew you. I knew you. He says in Hebrews that we were created, that everything in creation was created out of something invisible that became part of the visibility of this world. That means God had relationship with you before you showed up here. In love, he pre destined us before you came here before you came into existence he predestined you how does God see you God sees you from the lens of Christ and in Christ he loved you knew you chose you and gave you a destiny before you showed up in love he predestined us for a Adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus. In love, he predestined us. That means he gave you a destination before you started the journey. And he adopted you. That's another way of saying chosen. Because you know what happens. You know, most of you, um, you have brothers and sisters that you wish you didn't have. 
I know, I know. You don't have to tell me. But adoption is choosing the child that you want. So in adoption, that means that God chose you while knowing you. You know what that means? That means he knew how messed up you would look like and still chose you. He knew the difficulties you will have and still selected you. He knew the trials that you would go through and still said, I want her. You remember, I don't know if they do this in Australia. I, I remember being, being uh, outside during recess and they would play like kickball or soccer or basketball. And I was always the last chosen. I don't know why. I was always the last guy. I, I was, you know, somewhere in the line going, please pick me. Anybody. I'll pray for the team. Please. Please pick me. But, but, God, but God looked across the universe, saw you before you were born, chose you, and said, I want you, in spite of the fact that you can't play the game. Because he saw the future that you can't see right now. And in that future, you look like Jesus. In accordance, this is what I love, in accordance with his pleasure and will. Notice all of these words are saying the exact same thing. God not only chose you, but he wanted to choose you because it gave him pleasure to choose you. And it was his will to, you know what that means? Nobody forced you on God. God didn't go through a dilemma. You know, I grew up thinking God had a dilemma. Oh man, these poor people have sinned. Oh no, I got to show them my love. Well, who's going to die for them? Jesus goes, I will. Okay, well send them along. These guys don't even deserve our love. Well, we can't just let them die. What are they going to say about us? Oh, you know, we're love. Let's demonstrate our love for them. Oh, these guys, I wish you never created them. No, 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 no. Heaven was excited. God was excited when he was about to create you. And somebody said, you know, they might mess up. I know, I know, I know, but we're going to save them anyway. Well, you know, they, they, they might go through stuff that, 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 that goes against your will, but, but they'll be better because they're going to look like Jesus. But, 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 but what about when they, when, they, when they go against you? What about when they reject you? Oh, I love them. My love will overcome their mess. Oh, but, but, but what about when they get into sticky situations and they go, I wish there was never a God. They will know better. They'll be blinded for a while, but they'll get to see how much. I love them. It's worth it. Let's do it. Let's go. It was God's pleasure. It was God's will. It was God's desire to have you come into existence. That's how God sees you. That's how God views you. In Ephesians 2 verse 1, he says, He starts describing your life outside of God. You remember when we talked about Princess Diaries? Remember when we talked about that? And we talked about this princess who didn't know she was a princess. She didn't know she was of royal blood. She didn't know she was regal. She didn't know she was royalty. And so she lived a life opposite to that. In fact, not only was she not royalty, she was unpopular. Uh, she only had one friend in the entire movie. Do you remember that? One person actually cared about her for her. Everyone else didn't really like her. And, and, and she's living a life that is actually contrary to what she's been destined for. She's not destined for that life, but that's the life she's living. And why? There's only one reason why she's not living like a princess, because no one told her. In fact, guys, remember, her mother knew who she really was. But her mother was trying hard to make sure she doesn't end up back with that father. And so her mother never told her she was a princess and raised her as if she was normal and did everything to make sure all the regalness was out of her. But you know what happens when you're destined for something? No one can keep you from your destiny. When you're created for greatness, no one will keep you out. What, here's the, what God has for you is for you and no one can take that away so even though everyone tried to make sure she was never known to be a princess she became what she was destined for and this is what God says my word will not come back to me void 
what God has said about you will become a reality. His calling, Paul says, is irrevocable. That means, look, look, Romans 8, all things work together for the good of them that loves the Lord. That is, God will use the messed up situation in your life. God will use the, the, the worst situation in your life. The worst moments in your life is God's opportunity to scream, I'm here and I love you. He wants to let you know who you are. But before you know it, you're living a life that's contrary to it. And that's what Ephesians 2 describes. As for you, you are dead. You aren't even living. In your transgressions and sins. When you are living contrary to the character to which you are destined for. In which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. The spirit who is not work in those who are disobedient. No, notice that what Ephesians is saying is that whether we like it or not, we're all under some sort of spirit rule. Under the spirit of God or the spirit of the air. But none of us is doing what we want. We're actually lying to ourselves when we think, I've got my own mind. You know, I, love, I remember uh, walking and I saw a group of kids coming out of a bus, a, a bus and, and they all walked out. Um, they're wearing Timberlands. You guys have Tims here in Australia? Okay. They're wearing Tims, they're wearing jeans and a white T-shirt. Tims, jeans, white T-shirt, backpack. Tims, jeans, white T-shirt. But every person that walked out had the same thing. And I said to one of them, why do you dress that way? You know, I want to be myself. Uh, no, you don't. You look like everybody else. There's nothing unique. But this generation thinks we're being unique when we have the exact same things, run after the exact same stuff, and try to do the exact same thing, and we're going to end up in the exact same place. Outside of God, there is no direction because your destiny is in God. The reason why it's hard for you to figure out a plan outside of God is because there is no way for you to get to that plan until you get in God. Outside of God, you're just running in circles. You were created for God. You were created by God. And outside of God, there is no plan for your life. Because you were predestined in Christ before the foundation of the world. And until you get in Christ, you're not getting anywhere. It's kind of like getting on a plane. You know, when you're getting on the plane, you have the ticket. I'm, I'm going to call it Zion, Zion Airlines. You know, you have your ticket. It has a destination. It's going somewhere. It's getting somewhere. There's a pilot in front of the plane. And as long as you're in the plane, you're going to go where the plane is going. And this is what Paul means by being in Christ. In Christ, God has prepackaged everything you need for life. And outside of Christ, your baggage isn't getting anywhere, and you're not going anywhere. But the minute you step into, listen, what do you have to do when you get inside the plane? What do you have to do? Nothing. Pretty simple instructions. It's very simple. Get inside, sit your butt down, put your seatbelt on, and sleep. At least that's what my wife does when she gets on the plane. Just sleep. All you got to do is sleep. Sleep, rest. You can't go up to the pilot and go, sir, do you need anything? No, we don't need you because you don't know how to fly this plane. You can't ask the flight attendant, is there anything I can do to help? No, you can help by sitting down. There's nothing you can do. And this is what Christianity really looks like. Once you're in Christ, all you can do is follow his instructions. There's nothing else for you to do because you're already on the plane and the plane is already headed somewhere. There's nothing else for you to do but sit back and let the pilot fly the plane. Ephesians 2 verse 4 says, although this is the life that you lived beforehand, because of his great love for us, God, because of his what? Great love for us. God who is rich. He is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Although we were dead, he made us. You know what it means to make something? That means God said, you were dead, but I'm going to make you alive. 
not because of anything you've done, but I'm going to make it because I have the power to make that happen. He made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by what? Charis. By grace you have been, not will be, by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. That last part I love because what, what God is saying is if I were to, 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 to give it a, a quick title, it would be move over. Move over. You ever got, got into a couch and there's like four people on the couch already but you have nowhere else to sit? You go, move over. Move over. Look, 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 look. look. This, is what, this is what Ephesians is telling us. In Revelation we see it says that Christ is sitting on the throne with his father. And Ephesians tells us that he took us away from the situations of life that we are in. He raised us up and seated us with Christ. That means Jesus said to his father, move over. And he placed us right there on the same seat in the heavenly realm with Christ Jesus. This is amazing stuff. This is amazing stuff. He seats us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order. Why? Why has he sat us down? In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. That is in the coming ages, in the coming moments, in the future of futures. God is going to spend the rest of eternity showing us how much he loves us. The rest of eternity showing us grace after grace after grace. And here's the thing. We have only experienced grace in the presence of sin. So you only know grace because you don't deserve it. God is going to give you grace in the absence of sin. And that's amazing. For it is by grace you have been saved. He said it again, through faith. That is by believing this message. Just like the princess had to believe that she was a princess. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by work so that no one can boast. When the plane lands, you don't get to say to your neighbor, oh, good, good landing. You know, I did that. No, you didn't. You were sitting right next to me. There's nothing you did. You can't boast about it. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. How does God see us? God sees us as his work of art, as his masterpiece. We are God's handiworks, prepared, prepared to do magnificent things. He came and preached peace to you who are far away. And peace to those who are near. You know what God is saying? That because of what Christ has done, because of Christ, whether you are far from God or whether you are near to God, we both have peace. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of his household. Let's do a quick recap as we close. As the band comes up and they start singing this song, let's do a quick recap. God, God came to this planet, to this earth to preach one thing, to those who are far from him, to those who are near from him, that you now have access to God because of who I've shown humanity to be. You now have access to the Father. Through him, we both have access to the Father, those who are far, those who are near. And you are no longer foreigners and strangers of God, but now you are citizens with God's people. Be legal right to demand from the kingdom. You are kings, queens of God's kingdom. And that's why he's called the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Revelation 1 verse 5 says he has redeemed us in order to be kings. He's called us to live that life of royalty. We are called to live with Christ like Christ. 
fellow citizens with God's people, members of his household. You are called to be part of the family of God. Here's a recap. We are chosen before creation. We are not an afterthought. We are not an accident. We were planned. We were intelligently designed and intentionally destined. We are sons, not slaves. We are alive in Christ. We're not merely alleviated by wealth. We are destined to be elevated, not destined to be eradicated. We are God's masterpiece, created for majesty to do magnificent things. We are accepted into the royal family, not abandoned as an unloyal foe. We are legal citizens of the king. We are regal heirs of the father. 